Good morning, and welcome to the Wednesday, February 23rd, 2002 hearing of the House Pub of the House Education Finance Committee. Remote hearings such as this are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted online and is linked to in our public meeting notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members have the contents of their virtual packets available to them. And for the public, these same materials have been posted online. Members, if you're looking for all these items in one place, they are attached to the calendar event that Ms. Burt sent you for today. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hand via the app. Ms. Burt will place your name on the list to be recognized. Mr. Lee, would you please take uh, the roll? Thank you, Chair Dabney. Roll call will commence now. Uh, chair Dabney? Present. Representative Stansted will be joining us soon. Representative Cresha? Present. Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Daniels is, is excused. Representative Damith? Damith, present. Representative Dravkowski? Present. Representative Erickson? Uh, Erickson, present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Jordan? Jordan, present. Representative Marquardt is excused. Representative Mueller? Mueller, present. Representative Richardson? Present. Representative Thompson? Thompson, present. Representative Walgamot? Walgamot, present. Representative Shung? Present. Representative Joaquin? Present. At the moment, we have 14 members present, and that establishes a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, Representative Zhang, have you had the opportunity to review the minutes from Tuesday, February 22nd? And if so, would you like to move approval of those minutes? Yes, I would like to move approval of the minutes. Thank you very much. Any discussion to the Zhang motion, members? Seeing none, members, this is a voice vote. If you would please unmute. All those in favor of approving the Tuesday, February 22nd minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Zhang. Thank you, members. Thank you. Members, as you know, this week we're looking at uh, both the social emotional needs and the academic needs of students. We'll begin today with a presentation relating to student achievement at the beginning of this current academic year, the 2021-22 school year. We're lucky due to this virtual format to be joined by a researcher from the Pacific Northwest, Dr. Karen Lewis from the Center for School and Student Progress at NWEA. Dr. Lewis, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. It's a privilege to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much for the warm welcome and it's a pleasure to be with you all. My name is Karen Lewis. I'm a senior research scientist at NWEA. I'm going to share my screen so I can show you some slides. Uh, how to do that. All right, so it's very much a pleasure and I really appreciate the invitation to come speak about the research my team has been doing at NWEA, looking at the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated disruptions to schooling on student outcomes. This has been an ongoing research agenda for our team that kicked off back in March of 2020, almost immediately following the initial onset of the pandemic and the school shutdowns that followed soon after. We made some predictions at the very beginning of the pandemic about what might happen in those initial months when instruction ceased for many students because of the closure of schools. We predicted based on what we know about disruptive learning in other more normal circumstances, such as over the summer months or in prolonged absences, we made some predictions about what we expected might happen. And we predicted that we would see declines in both math and reading achievement over those initial weeks. Once school resumed in the fall of 2020, whether that was virtually for many students or in person in some cases, we were able to revisit those predictions based on actual data once students resumed testing. What we found is that our initial um, projections were overly pessimistic in some ways. We expected to see reading impacts, but the bright spot was that when students entered the classroom in the prior school year in the fall of 2020, reading achievement was actually largely parallel with a more normal year. 
we were starting to see signs of the impacts in math with students entering math achievement in the fall of that year between five to 10 percentile points lower than what we would see in a typical year. At the end of last school year, we revisited and took stock of where students had, the gains students had made over the course of the year. The bright spot that we had seen in reading achievement at the beginning of that school year had faded out by the spring, and we were starting to see signs of impacts in both reading and math, although the impacts were much start stronger in math. Notably, we also saw that the impacts of the pandemic on achievement were uneven, just as the impacts of the pandemic itself had been uneven. We saw the, the disproportionate impacts for students of color and students in high poverty schools. Here we are in the third school year impacted by the pandemic, and the research we have most recently released in December of 2021 took stock of what the status is of unfinished learning at the start of this third school year impacted by the pandemic. And that's the data I want to focus in on today to share with you. For this research, we took two different approaches to assessing unfinished learning this last fall. The first was what we call a cross-sectional approach. And here we're comparing how students are achieving in the fall of 2021 relative to peers back in the most recent fall testing season prior to the pandemic. So we're comparing back to the fall of 2019. For instance, we're gonna ask how are third graders this fall comparing against typical average scores for third graders back in the fall of 2019. The other way we look at unfinished learning is by tracking students longitudinally over the pandemic period. So here we're following students from the fall of 2019 to the fall of 2021. So for instance, third graders back in the fall of 2019, what kind of gains have they made in their academic skills entering the fall of fifth grade in 2021? Before I get into the actual data, I wanna say just a little bit of framing about our assessment to help you make sense of the results that I'll share today. NWA and MAP growth is an interim assessment. It's administered to roughly 25% of students in public schools across the country. It is an interim assessment, and that means it's assessed typically at multiple points throughout the year. So fall, winter, and spring is a typical scenario. This allows teachers to take stock of where students are, assess their growth and progress over time, with the goal of providing data back that really is meant to take a temperature of where students are and provide information for teachers to help them um, tailor their instruction to what the students in their classroom are actually the needs are of those students. It's important to also point out our, our test is computer adaptive, which means it's grade level independent. So we can assess and capture kids' skills if they're well above or well below grade level. In this research that I'm gonna to share today, we have a sample of over 6 million students and we look at grades three through eight specifically. And this is a national sample with over 14,000 public schools from across the country. Now, one other piece of framing information I wanna share is about our norms. So at, with our assessment, we have available both achievement and growth norms. What these norms do is help us to really contextualize and make sense of test scores. They're often quite arbitrary. If I told you a student scored a 220 on our assessment, that would mean very little to you without knowing our assessment as intimately as I do. We take our norms and use them to be able to situate a test score and situate performance relative to academic peers. So what that allows us to do is take a test score, an arbitrary number on our scale, and convert it into a percentile rank. And just a wee little refresher on what percentiles are, won't give you the full statistics lecture, don't worry. But you can interpret a percentile to tell us, for instance, if a student is scoring at the 65th percentile, we know that they scored as well as or higher than 65% of their peers. And importantly, these norms are based on pre-pandemic achievements. So this, these are national, nationally representative averages for a pre-pandemic sample of students. Our first research question, remember, was how does student achievement in fall of 2021 compare to pre-pandemic levels? And to make these comparisons, we're going to use those percentile rankings. I'm going to start by showing you what's happening in reading, and then we'll contrast that in a moment with what's happening in math. I want to set this, the table a bit for how to interpret the figures I'm about to show you, because these capture, these arrow plots capture a, quite a bit of information. So let's hone in first on one specific grade, looking at third graders. What these plots tell us is first at the base of the arrow, that circle is telling us the typical performance of third graders back in the fall of 2019. So that's our pre-pandemic comparison group. And in this case, in this sample for these specific schools, those third graders were at about the 55th percentile. The tip of the arrow is placed at where third graders were this past fall of 2021. So in this case, we're seeing the achievement of third graders in this sample of at about the 48th percentile. 
And then the number at the bottom of the arrow is capturing the difference between those two groups, which I refer to as a relative decline. So this captures the difference in achievement now versus where it was pre-pandemic. If we zoom out now to take in all of the grades in our study, you'll notice that we see evidence of relative declines in all of the grades that we've studied, ranging from three to seven percentile points. And obviously those differences are slightly larger amongst the youngest students in our sample. Now on your screen, I've also placed the results for math. Here too, we see evidence of relative declines comparing back to pre-pandemic achievement levels. But notice that the magnitude of the declines in math is larger than what we see in reading, ranging from between nine to 11 percentile points. And this difference in magnitude between math and reading is consistent with the research that we've put out in our previous briefs. So the high level summary of these figures is that reading and math achievement showed declines in the fall of 2021 relative to pre-pandemic averages. And it's important to note that those declines were larger in math. Before we move on to the other analyses I talked about where we'll look at growth over the pandemic period, I wanna spend a little bit of time asking whether these relative declines differ for key student groups. So we took these kinds of arrow plots, but used them and disaggregated by a couple of important demographic dimensions. The first I wanna talk about is school poverty level. So we're gonna compare what's happening for students in high versus low poverty schools. And to be able to categorize schools, we use a well-known proxy for poverty, which is a student eligibility for free and reduced price lunch. We have this information at the school level. So we categorize high poverty schools as schools where 75% or more of students are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. And on the other end of the spectrum, low poverty schools are those where 25% or fewer students are eligible. So returning to those arrow plots, first I'm showing you what's happening in reading, but now we're looking at just the results for students in low poverty schools. A couple of things to notice here. First, those arrows are pretty squat, partly because the scale has changed on these figures, but also because the relative declines for students in low poverty schools is smaller than those overall averages I've already shown you. Note also that this was a high achieving group of students to begin with, sitting well above the 50th percentile, which would be the national average pre-pandemic sitting at about the 70th percentile. So even with this pattern of some modest declines for students in low poverty schools, this is still a very high achieving group of students. Let's compare that now with what's happening for students in high poverty schools. Notice that the size of the arrows, the magnitude of the relative declines is larger for students in high poverty schools. In some cases, double or even more what's happening for students in low poverty schools. But also notice that the, where those circles are, the circles capturing pre-pandemic achievement patterns, there were already wide disparities between students in high and low poverty schools prior to the pandemic. So what's even more concerning about the disparity in the magnitude of the impacts is that it's taken those inequities that already existed prior to the pandemic and it has widened them over the course of the last two years. I'll show you the same breakdown by low versus high poverty schools, but now we're looking at math outcomes. Similar to the overall trends, the impacts in math are larger than what we see in reading, but also similar to the pattern we see in reading from math, we see that the impacts are larger for students in high poverty schools, exacerbating those pre-existing inequities. I also wanna draw your attention here to a pattern we've seen in several of our research briefs so far, in that the concentration of the impacts for students in high poverty schools is really there in our lowest grades. The elementary students seem to be the hardest hit. Our data don't allow us to really unpack the mechanisms, but I don't think it's a stretch to speculate that these are students, youngest students had the hardest time navigating Zoom school. It was the most challenging for students of that age group. And it might also be the case that for students in high poverty schools, their home situations made it so their caregivers were not able to provide the same amount of support for students in low poverty schools, whether that be because of other caregiving duties, whether that be because of careers and professions that didn't allow them to pivot to working from home to be able to provide that support. We can't see why, but this is a persistent pattern we see in our data and it's very concerning. Next, I wanna break down these arrow plots, but now comparing for race and ethnicity groups. And in our data, we have the adequate sample size to compare results for Asian American, white, black, Hispanic, and native students. And that's what I'm gonna show you next. Starting here in reading, first showing you outcomes for Asian American and white students. And here is similar story to what I've just walked through for comparing low versus high poverty schools. We do see evidence of impacts for Asian American and white students, 
However, the magnitude of those impacts is smaller relative to the overall averages. And this was a pretty high achieving group of students to begin with, sitting well above the 50th percentile. Now I'm dropping in what's happening for students of color, specifically Hispanic, Native, and Black students. Our Native categorization captures American Indian and Alaska Native students. Notice here, in many cases, the magnitude of the declines is larger than what we see for white students and Asian American students. Notice again, we also had that pattern of disparities for students' achievement levels prior to the pandemic. And this disparity in terms of the magnitude of the impacts means we are again seeing a widening of those gaps. Now on your screen, you're seeing the results for math. Same story, just larger impacts. Overall, math has been harder hit than reading. And overall, students of color have been harder hit than white and Asian American students. I'm putting those two graphs side by side now and capturing the magnitude of the relative declines in some heat maps. So this is just taking the size of the, the number at the bottom of those arrows and color coding it according to size to help us pick out patterns a little bit more clearly. What you'll notice here is that the heat map for math, much more red than what's happening in reading, same story I've told you before. And I want to hone in again and notice this pattern where the disparate impacts seem to be really concentrated for the youngest students in our sample. So the high level summary of these graphs is that reading and math declines were larger for Hispanic, Native, and Black students, and especially so in the elementary grades. I want to share one last result before I sum up, and this looks at that pattern of growth over the pandemic period. What kind of gains were students making in their test scores between fall of 2019 and fall of 2021? Here we're going to make uh, take advantage again of our norms. We have norms not only for achievement, but also for growth. And growth norms, what those do is help us situate test score gains relative to national averages for growth that we would expect based on pre-pandemic trends. And similar to the results I've just discussed, I'm going to transform those test score gains into growth percentiles. And they're interpreted in much the same way. So I'm going to show you a bar chart here that looks at growth across the pandemic, first in reading, then in math. The key point of reference when we look at the bars that I'm going to put on this graph is how they compare to the 50th percentile. Because the 50th percentile would indicate that the observed growth that we've seen over the pandemic was consistent with what we would have expected pre-pandemic. First for reading, these are the conditional growth percentiles across the grade we were able to follow. And recall this is longitudinal, so we're tracking students from instance from third grade to fifth grade and then converting their growth into a percentile. Notice here for each of the grades that we've studied, we see that gains across the pandemic are lagging, but lagging compared to national averages for pre-pandemic growth but not wildly dramatically so. Our third graders, for instance, they're sitting at about the 47th percentile, which is only three percentile points lower than national averages we'd expect based on pre-pandemic trends. Now in purple here, I've dropped in what's happening in red, and clearly the disparities between growth across the pandemic and pre-pandemic growth are much more notable in math. Looking again at those third graders, we see that their growth across the pandemic was at the 37th percentile, fully 13 percentile points lower than the gains we'd expect across that same period in a pre-pandemic sample. So high level summary here, student gains across the pandemic lagged, but it was especially true for math compared to reading. So to summarize our key findings, first we see consistent with what we reported in the past, that fall 2021 achievement was lower compared to a typical year. The size of the declines differed for math and reading. We saw larger declines in math, where declines were between nine to 11 percentile points, whereas in reading those ranged from about three to seven percentile points. I wanna point out that the size of the relative declines we saw in the fall, of 2021, they were roughly consistent with the declines we saw in the spring of 2021. So if we wanna look for a bright spot in these results, it's that we didn't see a widening at least in the declines between spring and fall of last year. It seems this might be some evidence that the impacts are starting at least to bottom out. We find that achievement was lower for all of the students in our sample, but disproportionately so for students of color, students in high poverty schools, and especially so in the elementary grades. And finally, we see student gains across the pandemic lagged pre-pandemic trends, but especially so in math. 
So if I were to summarize all of these key points in one statement, it's that if we want to be very targeted in the recovery efforts, we should be focusing our attention where we see the largest impact in the concentration tells us from the data that that's in math more so than reading for our youngest learners and particularly for students of color and students in high poverty schools. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I think we have some time for questions if anyone has them. Dr. Lewis, thank you for that. That was a lot, needless to say, uh, but, I, but I appreciate your taking the time with us and, and walking us through that. Uh, members, we do have a few minutes for questions. Dr. Lewis, I'd like to start uh, with one, which is about some of the language you used. At the very beginning of your presentation, you talked about learning loss. And then uh, you added in, uh, you instead substituted, I think, substituted the phrase uh, unfinished learning. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about that choice of language. Uh, does it all mean the same thing? Are those different approaches? Just help me with your language, please. Happy to, and thank you so much for underscoring that. In the initial weeks following the onset of the pandemic, when schools actually shut down and instruction ceased in many cases, we did actually expect to see some slides, an actual learning loss where students may have actually lost some skills. That's consistent with what we see over the summer months. You're probably familiar with the summer melt or summer slide. When students return to the classroom in the fall, they're often achieving slightly lower than what they were in the prior spring. But we switched our language to talking about unfinished learning because it's important to note that after that initial, uh, the initial phase of the pandemic, when schools actually did have to cease instruction, instruction resumed in the fall of 2020. It was just often in a disruptive manner. So it's not as if uh, all learning ceased. And we do see evidence that students were making gains last year and this so far. But what was lost was really instructional opportunities. Even in the case of schools did resume, it was often in a reduced capacity to what we would have expected in a more normal year for, as you know, many factors. Whether that was because students were learning virtually and teachers were not able to cover the same amount of content or whether it was because teachers were having to manage both in-person and virtual learners. But there does seem to be a loss of some instruction compared to a typical year. So we've used unfinished learning after that initial phase. I think that's a more apt summary of what we're seeing that students, um, lost out in instructional opportunities. And as a result, they're not learning, at, they are learning, but not at the same rates we would have expected in a more normal year. Thank you for that. I think that's that's a useful uh, and more affirming reframing mm -hmm. of, of where we're at in education. Uh, members, others with questions? It would appear, Dr. Lewis, that they're saving them for the bills that are coming up, uh, which, is, which is appropriate as well. Uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, thank you for getting up early on the West Coast uh, and joining us. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to have you come in uh, through the internet and not have to travel. Uh, I appreciate that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine. I so thank you very much. We appreciate your time today and your insights. Members, uh, we'll now begin uh, presentations of bills. A first bill up is House File 3088 from Representative Acom. It's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration and possible inclusion by 1110. Representative Wogemont, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3088 to be before the committee to lay it over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Wolgamont. Representative Acom, welcome to the committee. Please introduce your bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning to you and members. And um, thank you for the opportunity to present House File 3088, which makes permanent the increased math core funding this committee um, passed last session. It increases the base from 500,000 to 1 million starting in fiscal year 2024. As you know, MathCore is an AmeriCorps program, and as a former AmeriCorps member myself, I know firsthand the strengths of programs like MathCore that bring together qualified, trained workers dedicated to community service to address critical needs in our community. As we just heard from Dr. Lewis, the need for math supports is unfortunately growing. As you will hear today, MathCore 
has the research, evidence, and results to help meet the needs across the state. As we all know from our own experience learning math, math concepts build on previously learned concepts. If a student is struggling with early numeracy or math facts, it makes it much more difficult for them to learn higher level skills in later grades. Math Corps has responded to requests from schools and now offers math supports in grades K through three and layers in early numeracy concepts into the pre-K reading core program. The reality is it will take several years for our state to get all students back on track. Ensuring AmeriCorps current funding level continues into the future will allow them to meet more of our students' needs. I have two testifiers joining me this morning. First, we'll hear from Dr. Peter Nelson, a senior researcher at CERV Minnesota, and then he will be followed by Sumi Lee, who is a math core tutor. Thank you, Representative Acom. Dr. Nelson, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay, well, my name is Peter Nelson and I'm the Vice President of Impact and Innovation at CERV Minnesota, uh, which is our state's commission for AmeriCorps. So thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for giving us space um, to speak today. And thank you to Representative Acom for authoring the bill. Um, you know, today I'm gonna talk briefly about our approach to creating and improving AmeriCorps programming in the state. Uh, and then specifically um, about, the, about the value of MathCorps, uh, which is a proven uh, tutoring solution that you can find in, in schools across the state. So as an organization, uh, we leverage the committed people and resources of AmeriCorps to address our state's critical issues. Uh, we're able to do this really well in Minnesota because from design to scale, our programs are rooted in evidence and reflect the needs of the communities that we serve. Uh, this allows us to know that our American members don't just do things out in the world, they do things that have a known value in the context of education, um, that have a known value for kids and, 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 for, and for schools. Uh, now, thanks in part to that vision for program development, which is sort of a blend of science and service and community, um, as well as the rich history of service in the state. You know, you can find a lot of commitment from Minnesotans when it comes to devoting a year of service. Our educational programs have reached um, over 50,000 kids in math and 500,000 students in reading. Now, many of our AmeriCorps tutors go on to pursue a career in education. You can go out and find them in the schools and our research team at the commission, um, which is a unique thing in and of itself to have, um, contributes to the national conversation about what works when it comes to supporting um, schools and, and kids. So beyond the scale of math core, we, we have to talk about impact. Um, it's a program that's explicitly designed to address opportunity gaps, which as we saw earlier, are particularly evident in the area of math. Um, you know, with math, the bottom line is if you get behind, it's really hard to catch up because of the, way, the sort of hierarchical nature of math development. Um, so we have to create opportunities to catch kids up and those opportunities have to be impactful and, and they have to be engaging. Math core layers onto core instruction for kids who need it. So it's not a replacement thing, right? So I, this is in addition to, and that's the kind of support that we need to create for kids if, um, you know, if we're going to catch them up and we're going to address some of this, um, uh, uh, you know, the issues that we've been facing, especially over the past couple of years. So at the highest level, you know, Math Corps is a program that helps schools um, put kids in the driver's seat when it comes to picking their high school math courses. So getting them back on that trajectory to think about um, you know, what courses do they want to take and what career do they want? Um, it, so it boosts their skills, but it also helps make math and careers that have their roots in math more accessible for kids. Uh, over the last five years, uh, Math Corps has demonstrated consistent and strong effects on student achievement. For example, uh, we know that students who receive Math Corps, regardless of their grade level, gender, race, family income, outgrow similar kids at a rate that adds approximately a semester of growth in math skills. So again, just to, um, because we were kind of teed up for this, it seems like that, that is the kind of growth that we need in order to catch kids up. We have to, we have to create these opportunities for them. So the logic behind Math Corps isn't particularly flashy. I mean, it's about creating opportunities for kids to strengthen their relationship with math. But what makes us unique is our commitment to evidence and ongoing improvement. Each year, our, our team digs into the data to think about how we can improve. Um, we talk to school leaders, we talk to parents and kids, all in the interest of thinking about how we can get better. 
And I think that's why MathCore has been uh, and will hopefully continue to be part of our state solution to meeting the needs of, of kids and, and, and families. So the growing evidence base for MathCore, um, as well as our organization's history of innovation, has allowed us to partner with private funders um, to engage in projects that have really helped us improve the quality and breadth of programming in math. So if we just think about math over the past few years, I mean, we received funding from the PNC Foundation to expand our programming into pre-K. And so our pre-K includes both literacy and math, which we are finding that actually not only supports math, but actually um, helps kids' literacy skills even more uh, is to have that, that, that sort of blend of literacy and math. We've also received funding from the Cargo Foundation to create a K-3 math core, which is in direct response to feedback we've received from schools for a need for sort of programming in the K-3 space, um, supplemental programming. And just this month, um, we, uh, we received funding from uh, the business school at Duke to create our own assessment that better reflects the needs of the kids we serve. Um, you know, we were one of 130 applicants. We were the only U.S. finalists uh, in the international competition, and um, we ended up being selected thanks in part for, for they saw as strong local leadership and a lot of local partnerships. You know, uh, these kinds of investments um, have been absolutely critical in our efforts to innovate and improve. That's why I'm highlighting them here. Uh, but they aren't the engine that gets the program to schools. It, it, they, they aren't what gets us in front of kids. It gets us to kids. It's the ongoing support from the legislature that allows us to take these proven math supports and make them available to kids across the state. Um, so again, we're immensely grateful to be part of the conversation today. Uh, and we hope to continue to be a partner in this work. So Mr. Chair, committee, thank you again for your, um, for your time this morning. Dr. Nelson, thank you for that presentation. Next is Ms. Sumi Lee, who's a former Math Corps uh, member. Ms. Lee, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sumi Lee, good morning, Mr. Chairperson and members of the committee. My name is Sumi Lee and I lead community partnerships and health equity strategy at Libio Health. I'm also a board member of Serve Minnesota five years where I chair the racial equity and inclusion committee. And the reason I'm here today is because I served in AmeriCorps as a Minnesota Math Corps member. When I returned to Minnesota in 2013, after living abroad for several years, I was looking for an opportunity to find my place and begin my career. Being a Math Corps member not only provided me with a career trajectory of serving my community, but also provided me with a sense of belonging in my community. I served as a Math Corps member for two years at Central Park Elementary School in the Roseville School District where I grew up in. When I started my AmeriCorps service, I received rigorous training and all the tools I needed to tutor 24 fourth through sixth grade students each day. The tutoring ranged from providing diagnostic tests, tutoring each unit with engaging materials and repeated practices, and wrapping up each lesson with a unit test. Witnessing the confidence my students gained when certain math concepts clicked with them after repeated lessons and even some frustrating moments helped me see the impact my role was creating in these young lives. I'd like to share two stories that demonstrate the impact I witnessed as a Minnesota Math Corps member. One of the students I tutored got easily frustrated with math. He was familiar with most of the concepts, but when he got stuck, he would throw up his hands and want to quit the task altogether. He struggled when his homeroom math hour came around that often showed up as behavioral issues. I'm not sure what the magic was. Maybe it was the extra encouragements and compliments. Maybe it was the bribing of stickers to track his progress. Maybe he needed another caring adult. But after a full school year of working together, he passed his standardized math test. A few years later, I ran into him and his family at an apple orchard nearby where he recognized me from afar. His parents told me that, believe it or not, math is his favorite subject in high school. I couldn't have been more proud that I've played a role in shaping his future. And here's my second story. My service site Central Park Elementary School was experiencing a swift demographic change with new Karen students joining our schools. The teachers whom I worked with and were very supportive of me as a math core tutor pulled me aside one day to tell me that 
the current students who recently moved to Minnesota from refugee camps across the world used to talk about how they wanted to become soldiers and TV stars, but recently they started adding in a new career mix. They wanted to become a math teacher because of Miss Lee. It's an experience I talk about often as the chair of the Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee on the board of Serve Minnesota. Serve Minnesota is committed to creating career pathways through all of our programs and also increasing diverse representation in our AmeriCo members. A role model that looks like the students this program serves can create a lasting impact for our next generation. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to share that Math Corps works. Serving my community and delivering things that actually make an impact encourage me to stay on that career path. It's more important now than ever that we support students that could really use the extra help. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for that, Ms. Lee. Uh, Representative Erickson, you've been patient. Thank you. A question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a quick question for Ms. Lee uh, or for Dr. Nelson. You know, Minnesota has ro very robust, I shouldn't say very, they're robust mathematics standards. And I'm wondering to what extent the uh, AmeriCorps math tutors are uh, honed in uh, learning how to approach the concepts and the different uh, standards that you know can really be, uh, I think, challenging for many students, but even more so for parents and during distance learning. I know that it frustrated parents to try to help their children with, with math. So uh, just a comment, please, from Dr. Nelson or Ms. Lee about you know, what is your training in regard to Minnesota's math standards? Uh, Dr. Nelson, before we start discussing a math core for parents, uh, I'll let you uh, <laughs> yeah. answer Representative Erickson's question. Um, yeah, so, so math core is specifically focused on whole and rational number understanding. And we draw direct connections to the Minnesota state standards as well as the sort of common core standards. But it doesn't span across all the standards for the state. And that's specifically because we know that an understanding of whole and rational number understanding is the sort of like foundational skill set that you need in order to really benefit from the core instruction that's happening in the classroom. So Math Core is in addition to core instruction. And because we're focused on whole and rational number understanding, um, that really is going to position kids to like make movement on the on the on the highest yield skills right where you can get these sort of long run benefits if you can really understand how fractions work right um and another piece that that really helps is math core has afforded the opportunity to keep learning or achievement constant and allow time to vary so however long it takes kids to get to sort of understand or master a concept, we allow for that time where that doesn't always happen in education because we've got lots of kids and their, their needs vary, but the program's delivered in, in small groups of two or three students, which allows the tutors to sort of move at the pace that the kids need in that area of whole and rational number understanding this concept of mastery, of, of mastery learning. Um, and uh, the, only, the only other thing I'll mention is that Whole and rafts from number understanding were not also grade specific. So if you're a seventh grader and you're struggling, we're still focusing on skills that may that 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 may have been introduced in the curriculum and in sixth grade to ensure that you're prepared, right? Prepared in the area of whole and rational number standing to really benefit um, from your classroom instruction. So thank you for that question. Represent Representative Erickson, follow-up. Uh well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Nelson. I think that is uh, so important that time is an important factor in the tutoring, and children are going to. And they, we found that out during distance learning. They're all over the place, and you know, for parents to try to help them was was really uh, a barrier uh, be, because they probably didn't understand that concept of it's going to take a lot of time here for some of our children to catch up. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Ms. Lee, can you speak at all uh, to how the tutors interact with the classroom teachers? Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Um, in my school in Roseville, there was a reading core tutor and me as a math core tutor. Licensed teachers in the school were our internal coaches and oversaw our work. So I worked very closely with my internal coach and with regular observations during tutoring sessions. Um, I was also part of every grade level team meeting for the fourth 
fifth and sixth grade teams before each school day began. And I was part of the parent teacher conferences for students whom I worked with. I had a strong working relationship with my teachers. And I think if, were, if you were to ask them, they, I think they'd say they appreciated having the extra support for their students. And we had a very positive working relationship. And Mr. Chair, may I, may I add on to Ms. Lee's comment? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to share that. So each year we do have a survey that we distribute to schools in which our members serve. And 90% of 90% um, of teachers report that Math Core has a positive impact on their students, and 95% of teachers say they agree or strongly agree that they feel positive um, about having students in their classrooms participate in Math Core. Um, and I think that's in, in part due to this sort of open line of communication between tutors and and, and teachers. Excellent. Thank you very much, Representative Acom. Any closing comments? Just thank you for the opportunity to present House File 3088 and um, for the discussion about the math core, which is really an important solution to our increasing need for math support. So I appreciate the time of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Acom. And I should note that when this uh, hearing was, was noticed, uh, it included uh, information on how the public could testify if they so chose. We received no requests to testify on this bill. With that, Representative Wolgamont renews his motion to lay over House File 3088 for possible inclusion or further consideration at a later date. Dr. Representative Acom, Dr. Nelson, Ms. Lee, thank you all for joining us today. Next, we'll hear from Representative Adelson about House File 3300. Members, it's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill by 1050. Representative Zhang, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3300 before the committee and to lay it over, over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? Uh, yes, Chair, I move House File uh, 3330 for possible inclusion, Chair. 3300, but yes, thank you for that, Representative John. Sorry. No worries. Uh, Representative Al Adelson, Edelson. Welcome to thank the you. I know. Yeah, everybody says Adelson. It's Edelson, um, but that's okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. How, so House File 3300 would appropriate $33 million for the 2023 fiscal year until June 30th of 2025. This would account for training all K through five teachers in the letters program. Now this legislature, we appropriated 3 million last year, which um, I MDE can uh, expand upon where that is right now. What I would like to do uh, chair at this point is I have a lot of testifiers plus MDE and Dr. Schulting is here. So I think there's a small presentation that if we could get to that um, to respect members time and, and also the testifiers that would be preferable. So the MDE uh, um, presentation and then all of the testifiers. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you, Representative Adelson. Uh, Dr. Schulting, State Dyslexia Specialist with the Department of Education. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Dabney. Uh, my name is Amy Schulting. And as you said, I'm the department's uh, dyslexia specialist. Um, so Representative Edelson asked me to speak today on behalf of the work at MDE related to literacy and letters. Uh, so I'll speak for a few minutes to provide a brief overview of letters and specifically the $3 million, $3 million letters grant that MDE is overseeing. So as you may know, uh, letters stands for language essentials and yeah, you can keep going to the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, as you may know, LETTERS stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. It's important to note that LETTERS is not a classroom curriculum or a set of instructional materials. Rather, LETTERS is a rigorous professional development program based on the science of reading. So teachers learn how the brain learns to read, how to teach reading to all students, as well as how to intensify instruction to support struggling readers, including those with dyslexia. It's also important to clarify that Letters is not a program specific to dyslexia or to special education. It's a general education professional development program appropriate for all K-5 teachers, as well as teachers at all tiers of instruction who are responsible for teaching reading. And this is both at the elementary and the secondary level. So this would include reading specialists, literacy coaches, interventionists, and special education teachers. Letters training includes eight units 
and approximately 144 hours of instruction. There are two textbooks, online training modules, and bridges to practice, which is where teachers apply what they've learned in their classrooms. Participants also complete six hours of live online training after each unit. And those who have successfully completed letters are also eligible to become a letters trainer called a facilitator. And there are facilitators for both volume one and volume two. So now I'd like to provide an update on the letters grant registration and rollout. MDE launched letters registration on December 15th. And the current $3 million of funding allows for 2,120 educators to complete letters training. There's been a significant interest in this opportunity across the state. And even though the registration site went live right before the holidays, over 1,000 educators registered within the first five days. With this funding, participants will complete all eight letters units by June of 2023. Teachers are registering individually, not as a school or district team. So MDE will also provide guidance to district administrators regarding supporting letters participants. The current participants on the next slide include K-5 classroom teachers, as well as elementary and secondary special education teachers, reading specialists, interventionists, and literacy coaches. It also includes administrators and professors. Additional roles include uh, regional centers for excellence advocates based there, the Minnesota service co-op staff and MDE literacy staff. Regarding registration, as of yesterday, February 22nd, 1,937 educators have confirmed their participation. They're now receiving their letters, textbooks and access to the online modules. And even since that day, approximately 20 additional educators have already registered for the remaining 183 slots. And we're now in the process of confirming their participation as well. And while teachers have only, if I'll pause for a second to just share this feedback. While teachers have only just begun their training with unit one, we're already receiving positive feedback. So for example, one of the participating administrators who is an assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction said, and I quote, I am halfway through unit one and I wish every reading teacher had this knowledge. Thank you for bringing this opportunity to Minnesota schools. It is a lot of work, but it is the right work. On the next slide, while countless educators have reached out to MDE with significant enthusiasm about this training opportunity, there have also been some challenges with regard to registration. Uh, for example, approximately 500 additional educators expressed their interest in letters and access to registration, but did not complete it or were unable to accept a training slot at this time. And the registration challenges that we've identified include the following. COVID-19 related professional demands on educator time, COVID-19 illness, for educators or their families. Letters also require significant investment of time and the river is equivalent to graduate level coursework. So the current model requires teachers to complete letters training outside of school hours. Um, so this may have been a barrier for some participants. Um, also due to significant interest in letters across the state, some schools and districts decided to provide letters training to their staff internally. So teachers opted to register for letters through their district rather than MDE. Now on the next slide, with regard to next steps in supporting letters trained teachers, we know that teacher knowledge in the science of reading is essential to improving classroom instruction and student outcomes. We also know that teacher knowledge and training alone is not enough. So MDE has conducted a letters implementation pilot to better understand the supports that teachers need in addition to training in order to change classroom instruction and improve student outcomes. So this work has demonstrated it's important to support implementation within an MTSS framework and that teachers need ongoing instructional coaching, support from administrators who have training in the science of reading, and they also need access to evidence-based instructional materials. So in closing, I just wanna say, I greatly appreciate your commitment to supporting literacy outcomes in Minnesota. And I'm of course happy to answer any questions that you may have. Dr. Schulting, thank you for that. Uh, any questions for Dr. Schulting at this time from members? Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my first comment is to Representative uh, Edelson. Uh, thank you for your uh, 
interest and commitment to letters and for your seeing the need for it by you know, increasing funding to 33 million over the governor's piddly 5 million. I mean, that, that is just so great that you have shown that kind of a commitment to improve reading. Um, for uh, Dr. Schulting, uh, looking at the pilot and noticing that professors at five universities are involved in the pilot, have they come to the admission that they haven't been teaching in their teacher preparation programs uh, the scientific uh, reading uh, 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 the law that we have in place, uh, you know, is, is this a recognition now that they haven't been doing their job? Uh, because, uh, you know, we would not be in this state uh, of, of disarray among reading if the law were followed. And it's very specific what we have in law. And I remember when former Senator Jen Olson worked so hard to get this implemented and acted into law and then supposedly implemented in our teacher programs. And I probably should be talking to Pelsby more than that because when I served on the Board of Teaching, uh, two of us were always assigned to evaluate teacher prep programs. And I always brought back as part of my evaluation what the students told me. Uh, now I served in the 90s and so the comments were different then from oh, I would imagine what they would be today. But I, I just can't imagine that Pelsby hasn't been targeting uh, universities with teacher preparation programs that aren't following the law. So is this an admission, do you think? I mean, what are they saying to you about what has happened within their programs that has not prepared teachers to know how to teach reading in our classrooms so that we have to now spend an additional 33 million, which I'm grateful for. I don't know if it'll become fact, but I'm grateful that we're making this effort because teachers have to know how to teach reading. Um, Dr. Schulte. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Uh, well, I, I of course cannot speak for Pelsby um, and would defer to the professors themselves to speak on behalf of their own learning. I know that we have had, as you said, a number of professors go through letters training um, and we have, while we're still finalizing the numbers in this current registration, uh, we will be able to provide numbers of uh, professors that have registered uh, for this next wave of funding, uh, as well as, um, of course, you know, their experiences. I would defer to them to, to share their experiences directly. I know that they've, They've had positive feedback on their participation in letters. Um, that is definitely something that I have, I have heard. Chair Dabney, you're muted. Of course I am. Thank you, Dr. Schulting. Uh, members, we have a number of testifiers on this bill. Uh, remind uh, testifiers that we've allotted two minutes each uh, to you, I'd ask you to be respectful of the other testifiers uh, and stay within that limit. We'll start with uh, Dr. David Law, Superintendent of the Anoka Hennepin School District. Superintendent Law, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. David Law, Superintendent for the Anoka Hennepin School District. Chair Davney, members of the committee, thanks for having us back again. I'll be brief. I'm, I brought two practitioners with me. I'll just, as a general reminder, of where we were going into the letters decision. This has been third year literacy has been a board priority since I've been here and this is my eighth year. We were a district one of 10 in the state that had increasing proficiency rates for our, our readers for seven straight years pre-pandemic. Even leading up to the pandemic, we had been fairly stagnant while state averages were dropping. So we, were, we weren't in crisis mode and we still wanted to do better. Um, among our peers, our gaps in reading proficiency between measured groups are among the lowest, and yet we're still, we still know we can do much better. Um, we are really doubling down on third grade literacy, and letters is a big part of that, and I'm going to turn it over to the next two presenters to tell you a little bit more, more on that, to be respectful of other people's time, but I'll also stand for questions at the end. Sure. Thank you, Superintendent Law. Uh, next. Ann Sangster, Director of Curriculum for Elementary Education. Ms. Sangster, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I am Ann Sangster, Director of Elementary Curriculum in Anoka Hennepin. Thank you for the opportunity to share our experience with letters. In early 2021, 20, we met as a district team and developed a comprehensive professional development plan to continue to support our teachers who teach reading. Letters was one component of that plan, which was based on incoming third grade map reading data, 
which has plateaued since the 2017 school year. This year, we have 560 participants in letters, K2 classroom teachers, half of our third grade teachers, those teachers were chosen based on incoming third grade reading data, literacy intervention staff, building principals, district level leadership, including EL and SPED. Um, we acknowledge from, and also Dr. Schulting talked about this as a college level course. We knew that the biggest challenge would be the time commitment. So we started off um, giving our teachers a one paid day paid opportunity in August, 2021 to get started on the coursework. As we began the coursework, we made adjustments after gathering input and feedback from teachers. Our original plan was to complete units one through four, but we will actually complete units one through three this year, four through six during the 22-23 school year, and complete the training in 23-24 for this first cohort. The additional time we felt was essential for true understanding and bridge to practice opportunities. We are also committed to giving our teachers time to complete during the duty day and our district building staff development days. We recognize that teachers need additional time outside of the duty day, so we've compensated our teachers as they complete each unit. Moving forward, we will be onboarding the new K-2-2 teachers and have opened up the opportunity to third grade teams, EL teachers, and special education teachers. Even Ms. though Ms. those Sanger, teachers, I'm sorry? You, Ms. Sanger, we're at, we're at time. If you could just finish up briefly. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, they're aware of the tremendous workload. They um, still are interested in taking letters. So I'm gonna have you hear from um, a teacher on the front line who is supporting our teachers through this important professional learning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sangster. I have next on my list, Deborah Day, a teaching and learning specialist for elementary education. Ms. Day, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Deb Day and I'm a teaching and learning specialist for English language arts in Anoka Hennepin. So um, over the past years, we have provided professional development um, and we have brought some of the best research on researchers on literacy in to um, provide that professional development for our staff, but there was little bridge to practice. After our implementation of our core reading uh, curriculum, which was wonders, we saw an increase in our K2 data. Um, that data had sat stagnant. Um, after our, our implementation, we saw an increase um, and then we hit another plateau. So we needed something to uh, find a bridge to practice. And so as we did our research, letters uh, was a different type of professional development. Not only do you get the science behind instruction, you bridge that science to practice. So letters gives teachers the opportunity to watch practitioners, implement routines and practices that engage students. And to acknowledge that letters requires that 144 hours, which is 18 full days of staff development over the next three years, um, we, we are supporting and we're being responsive to our, our teachers. Um, and that is the biggest challenge is the time. But our teacher feedback that we have received, you know, they have said it is hard work, but it's the right work. The teachers acknowledge that they're moving away from the three queuing system to a code-based instructional approach based on their learning from letters. They're common, um, there's common routines amongst our classroom teachers and support staff working with students. It puts the why behind the phonics lessons that are outlined in the Wonders curriculum. They understand why they're teaching and what they're teaching. Letters has shifted the conversations during collaboration. Teachers are trying different things. They're sharing what they're trying and they're learning from each other. Um, Wonders um, has a, um, asks you to follow three case study students, um, but that's shifted to all students. So Ms. we've Ms. seen- Day, if you could complete your testimony, please. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we're early in our implementation or in our in our professional development, but our winter data suggests an upswing in our phonemic awareness data, which we hope uh, signals a shift in practice. Excellent, Ms. Day. Thank you for that. Next, Jess Jessica Town Gunderson, Director of Teacher and Teaching and Learning from the Princeton Public Schools. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Thank you for having me. I'm Jessica Town Gunderson, Director of Teaching and Learning at Princeton Public Schools. Um, and my testimony just re revolves around our experience so far this year. So we have about 30 individuals. That includes a fourth of our uh, kindergarten through fifth grade teaching staff, as well as interventionists, uh, building principal, myself as Director of Teaching and Learning, and um, our literacy coach and some other teacher supports. We are in the learning together, and what we are experiencing is system shift. So what is happening inside classrooms is a change in how we use classroom time. There is a change in what we do during interventions. There is a change in what we prioritize for programming both after school and in summer. And there is a complete shift in what we understand works for reading instruction. So um, believing that reading is a basic human right and the only way to get equitable outcomes for children is to make sure they can read. Uh, letters is the way we are seeing to transform how we teach. Thank you very much, Ms. Town Gunderson. Next, Caitlin Snyder with Education Minnesota. Ms. Snyder, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Caitlin Snyder and I am a lobbyist with Education Minnesota. Education Minnesota represents 86,000 educators, active and retirees across the state in each of your districts. Um, I'm here today to speak in support of the bill in front of you Actually, I'd hoped not to be with you this morning. Um, we have a member from Northfield who had hoped to join but wasn't able to make it. And the reason why I wanted her to come and speak to you about her experience is that she has been teaching for over 24 years now. And she recently shared that receiving the letters training has really reinvigorated her, pro her, her um, progress in the classroom. It's really given her more energy with engaging with her, her students and, and bringing this new perspective um, to the teaching and learning. So um, hopefully she'll get to join you in the future. A couple of notes of areas in the bill that I think could be a little bit stronger are um, to Dr. Schulting's point about how there are 144 hours required in this training. Um, it needs to be carved out in people's day, um, being provided paid time in order to access this training and, and being provided the support um, is very powerful um, for best practices to make sure that people are engaging with the materials in the way that they need to. Also, if this were to move forward at the current price point, I think we could probably talk about including current teacher candidates who are um, learning these practices um, in their programs um, and, and could be better equipped to enter the classroom on day one with this literary instruction. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Next, Rachel Berger, Executive Director of Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota. Ms. Berger, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Dabney. Uh, my name is Rachel Berger and I am the Director of Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota. Um, great to be with you here today and hear all of the wonderful testimony on such an important topic. Equity in education starts with learning to read. More than 20 years ago, Congress appointed a national reading panel which reviewed over 100,000 studies to determine what techniques work best for teaching children to, to read. The evidence that structured literacy with explicit phonics enhances student success in learning to read was really clear and compelling. There isn't a lack of knowledge on how students best learn to read, rather a delayed reaction in responding to one of the most significant skills required in education. Most students in Minnesota's classrooms aren't learning to read and the method of instruction used is the obvious reason why. How do we know students aren't learning to read? Minnesota's, or the NAEP scores show that 62% of Minnesota students are reading at a level below proficient and we haven't moved the needle on that in more than two decades. 46% of white fourth graders scored proficient or above in reading, and only 19% of their black peers scored proficient or above. It's sobering that half of white students failed to meet that proficiency bar, but figures for black students should outrage anyone who care about social justice and equity in education, because 19% is not equity. Those stats translate to really bleak futures for struggling students. 54% of males who drop out of school and 80% of youth involved in juvenile justice share a common denominator, low literacy skills. 
I can't be the only one wondering why we have all the science we need to understand how students learn. And we understand the impacts of poor instruction, but we failed to make the changes necessary up until now to put those methods into place in a classroom. So reading is one of the most significant skills a student will learn while in school. And education is one of the costliest items in our state budget. Through no fault of their own, teachers and administrator knowledge varies greatly from school to school. And these inconsistencies in instructional knowledge uh, results in poor results for students and helps contribute to the achievement gap. Ms. Berger, I'll need you to wrap up, unless that oh. was it. <laughs> no, that wasn't. Um, and sorry, as an individual with dyslexia, it um, kind of flusters me too. Okay, so here's what I want to say. Uh, since our organization began working on literacy in 2013, we've been working to get teachers the training they need to teach more students to read in the classroom before reading failure starts. Our focus is teacher professional development in the science of reading. And we have worked collaboratively with Minnesota School Boards Association, the Department of Education, and Education Minnesota on this in particular. Um, we've been successful with letters last year and we're asking the state to step up and use a portion of the budget surplus to ensure that all K to five educators are trained in letters. And this is just really to ensure that all students have access to a highly trained educator and that access doesn't come down to zip code, social economic status, or parents with resources. The consequences of our failure to act now have real consequences for kids as individuals, their families, and greater society. Reading opens doors of opportunity. For now, only half of Minnesota students cannot open them. Thank you, Chair Dabney. Any questions? We'll hold questions until the end, but thank you for okay. that, Ms. Berger. Uh, last on my list, uh, Keenan Jones, Department of Innovation, Design, and Learning with the Hopkins Schools and founder of Literacy for Freedom. Mr. Jones, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and all members. Um, I'm Keenan Jones, um, Hopkins Public Schools, founder of Literacy for Freedom, a nonprofit dedicated to Black male literacy and academic achievement. Uh, my name is Keenan Jones. I'm here to speak to the impact of letters training for teachers and in increasing early literacy rates for young Black boys. Um, one thing remains is that many educators in high needs districts are not getting the training needed so that they can gain an understanding of the science of reading to close this literacy gap that exists for young black males. A uh, few statistics, Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu, who's a, a major scholar in black male literacy, says that only 12% of eighth graders are proficient in reading, 29% are retained. The dropout rate is 25 to 53% for black and Hispanic students, and 52% of male inmates are black and Hispanic. Um, in Minnesota, according to the MDE, which is Minnesota Department of Education data report card, 54% of, and this is from 2019, 54% of fourth grade black males are considered below basic in reading. When they get to eighth grade, it jumps to 60% below basic. Um, and in one metro suburban school district, 58.9% uh, of black males placed in a high risk category in math and reading assessments. A quote is, poor test scores are not the worst consequence of illiteracy for these young men, but recent research shows that a lack of adequate reading and writing skills can set the stage for a continuance of intergenerational poverty, crime, and substance abuse. Uh, we know that uh, low literacy rates are early on as a predictor of literacy rates down the road, and giving teachers the time and training needed to learn the science of reading and letters could be impactful in preparing our youngest students with the foundations needed for future success in school and life. In 2013, the Mississippi legislature passed the Literacy-Based Promotion Act, which was funding set aside to educate teachers on the science of reading. Six years later, the heavily Black Southern state posted the highest gains in reading proficiency in the, in the nation. It's so important that students of color understand text well early on so they can have the foundation to understand more complex texts later. Investing in literacy is an investment in equality, an investment in justice, and an investment in our leaders of tomorrow who so des desperately need us to step up for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Questions from members? 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I jumped ahead. My apologies. Uh, when the hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify. Two individuals have uh, signed up to testify. Uh, first, Kalia Pringle, the Minnesota Parents Union. Ms. Pringle, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Daphne. My name is Kulia, and I just want to make a correction for the record. I'm with the National Parents Union, not the Minnesota Parent Union. It is, it is another organization. Oh, um, Bob, thank you for that correction. No oh, problem. No. So my name is Kulia Pringle with the National Parents Union. I'm here today with my fellow organizer of National Parents Union, Latine Families in Minneapolis, Maria Cisneros, who will testify after me, and she will testify in her language. Um, a year ago, we formed the MPS Academics Advocacy Group in 2020 with Minneapolis Public Schools parents. We spent over a year speaking with parents, students, and teachers to gain on-the-ground knowledge about what is happening in Minneapolis Public Schools around literacy and the science of reading curriculum used or not used, such as gross programming in Title I schools and professional development for teachers. We have toured schools that use this girls programming. And we saw firsthand how programming that white affluent parents were able to buy implemented in classrooms with children of color and low income children. As we spoke with families, we found out that parents of struggling readers do not find support at their child's schools. Many don't even have the words. They just know something is not right. Many parents worry about their child being criminalized for behavior problems and labeled with special education titles. For black children, it's EBD because they cannot fully participate in the classroom activities. Parents of means also have struggling readers in districts where curriculum is not rooted in the science of reading, but are able to buy themselves out of an illiterate problem. As education advocates, we fight for so many things, but they all boil down to one thing, ensuring educational systems work for all kids. That means schools must produce measurable, outcomes in teaching and learning. Right now in Minnesota, wherever Black children are, we're not getting that. In my community, in the Black community, it's either read or die. MPS has the nation's worst, for, fourth worst racial disparities in academic outcomes for students of color. Three or four Black and Native American students read below grade, grade level. I am hoping today that um, this committee, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ms. Pringle. I appreciate that. Uh, next and last on the list, Maria Cisneros, also uh, affiliated with the National Parents Union. Ms. Uh, Cisneros, tardes. welcome. Yeah. Buenas tardes, comisionado y representante de la silla. Uh, mi nombre es Maria Cisneros, soy representante de Unión Nacional de Padres. Yo estoy aquí uh, hoy para apoyar la propuesta de ley a L, con las siglas LTRS. Número HS 330, es necesario y urgente que inviertan en entrenamientos para maestros, educadores y administradores, ya que es muy importante la alfabetización y lenguaje de idiomas. Hay personas muy expertas que pueden dar los entrenamientos de conocimiento profundo y avanzado para que nuestros maestros y educadores y administradores sean expertos en la alfabetización y lenguaje en las ciencias del, de lectura, escritura, la comprensión. Y sería una, una gran solución que nuestros estudiantes tengan estas herramientas de alfabetización en su aprendizaje profesional. Es importante que la alfabetización sea flexible para maestros, educadores, con la, eh, con la campaña de las siglas eh, ELTRS para que tengan la oportunidad de enseñar a nuestros estudiantes las habilidades necesarias para administrar las funciones de enseñanza de la lectura con mucha ciencia, fluidez, vocabulario, comprensión y escritura y lenguaje a nuestros estudiantes, ya que están demasiado atrasados en la brecha de la alfabetización. No están a nivel de la educación que deberían de, de recibir y tener cada uno de nuestros estudiantes. Es urgente que escuchen la voz de los padres de color. Por favor, inviertan para que los maestros, educadores y administradores den buena enseñanza de alfabetización y lenguaje de nuestros estudiantes de color, ya que del kinder a quinto son los primeros grados de existencia para el buen aprendizaje para nuestros estudiantes eh, latinos, afroamericanos y de color. Apoyen, por favor, a los estudiantes en la inversión de los idiomas, um, no a abordar directamente a los estudiantes del idioma en inglés o a la educación de inversión en los idiomas. Sin embargo, es bien importante eh, que apoyen esta, esta campaña de LETRS, no solo para aprender cómo enseñar 
a brindarles el, a la alfabetización en inglés a nuestros estudiantes, sino también aprender cómo se requiere la alfabetización en cualquier idioma. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. Cisneros. De nada. Members, uh, with that, Representative Edelson, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, uh, well, I, I, I do, uh, but if, if members want to, is there any time for questions? Or are we out of time? Uh, we're, we're at time. We have one more. We are at on time. Well, I, I would just like to thank my testifiers. Um, as we've heard today, I think Mrs. Pringle really highlighted that the point is that right now we've, privac we've privatized literacy in the state of Minnesota. We need to make sure that our educators are getting the best training possible. This is a big investment for a big problem that we have in our state. If we, uh, I will be working on the bill to make sure that we are uh, targeting as well, making sure that this, this funding is going to teachers of color and going to the areas where we see the NAEP scores have the highest needs. I would also just say that one of the other testifiers said that reading, reading is a basic human right. And I would absolutely agree with that. I think that is a bipartisan issue. I thank you, uh, Representative Erickson, for your words too. I think it is important that we make a big investment. And I want to thank everybody for having me today. Thank you, Representative Edelson. With that, Representative Zhang renews his motion to lay over House File 3300 for possible inclusion or further consideration at a later time. Our final bill presentation will be hearing from Rep Representative Wolgamot about a bill to fund training for science and math teachers. Uh, our intent is to try to lay this one over by 11.55 a.m. Let's see how we do. Uh, Representative Wolgamot, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3344 to be before the committee? and lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? Mr. Chair, that is my motion, so moved. Very good, thank you. And I understand Representative Wolgamont, before we proceed further that you have an author's amendment that you'd like uh, to offer to get the bill in the shape you'd prefer. Uh, would you like to move the A1 amendment to be before the committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Can you speak briefly to the amendment? Yes, I can. The uh, amendment is simply adding two appropriations, um, $2.6 million to line 1.6 and $2 million to line uh, 1.15. And once we get the bill in the shape uh, that I would like it to be in, I can further explain uh, the reasons behind those numbers, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Wolgamont. Any discussion to the Wolgamont motion? Seeing none, again, members, this is a voice vote. If you would please unmute. All those in favor of the Wolgamot motion uh, for the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Representative Wolgamot, to your bill as amended. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. I am here today to present House File 3344. Uh, which pertains to uh, funding training opportunities for math and science teachers. The reason behind this bill, Mr. Chair and members, is because in 2019, the Minnesota Department of Education revised its standards for science teachers. And currently at this time, it is revising these standards for math teachers. Um, we expect the science uh, standards, uh, science revision standards to be implemented in 2023. And it is likely that these revised math standards will be implemented around 2024, 2025. Uh, but to be able to best implement these standards, of course, our teachers need training and need opportunities to be able to teach to the standards that they're required to teach to. So that's why I'm bringing this bill forward. Um, it appropriates uh, $2.6 million in grants to the uh, uh, grants to be executed through MDE to the Minnesota Science Teachers Association for professional development to implement those standards. And then $2 million um, to the Minnesota Council of Teachers of Mathematics for professional development to implement these standards. Um, this is uh, will affect about 6,000 teachers. The reason for the discrepancy and why we need an additional uh, $611,000 is because of um, standards license requirement changes for our earth science standards. So there'll just be a little bit extra for those science teachers. Um, again, MBE will oversee the grants. This will not fully fund the professional development that will need to take place. But again, since this is statewide standards, uh, we need a statewide approach to making sure that our school districts 
have the resources that they need to give the teachers the professional development that they need to be able to teach to these revised standards. So that is the gist of the bill, Mr. Chair and members, and I do have some uh, testifiers. Well, thank you, today. Representative Wogelmont. First on my list is Dana Smith, a science teacher from the Bemidji Public Schools. Ms. Smith, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, my name is Dana Smith and I teach at Bemidji Middle School. Please proceed. Members of the House Committee on Education Finance, thank you very much for hearing my testimony today. I am currently a sixth grade teacher at Bemidji Middle School, and I have taught middle and high school science in greater Minnesota for the last 23 years. I come to you today as an MNSTA, Minnesota Science Teachers Association, member serving as the state's earth science representative and coordinator of a program called ESTEP, Earth Science Teacher Education Project. We are asking you to fund up to 1,150 Minnesota sixth grade and high school earth science teachers over three years as they learn the content, skills, and strategies needed to teach earth science effectively. Minnesota teachers, especially in greater Minnesota, are in need of targeted high quality professional development in the area of earth and space science. We have three sixth grade E-STEP workshops already tentatively scheduled around the state for this summer, as well as two high school workshops. Over three summers, we want to offer workshops in or near Bemidji, Moorhead, Mankato, Alexandria, the Iron Range, Duluth area, Brainerd, Redwood Falls area, Rochester, Winona area, Worthington, Albert Lee, Austin area, and multiple locations in the Metro. I can testify as an outstate teacher that access to high quality professional development and additional licensure preparation for teachers in greater Minnesota is few and far between and not something districts can afford. MNSTA fully supports the 2019 Minnesota Science Standards and recognizes that they were built on best practices and research. And we believe all Minnesota students deserve to have teachers that are well-trained and prepared in these new cutting edge practices and pedagogy. All Minnesota K-12 science educators would benefit from this professional development. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, because testing doesn't begin until 2025, we have the time to be able to train many, many teachers in the state and help with the effects of the pandemic by focusing a multidisciplinary approach in reading and math as well as science. Please consider this request for funding for a true community-based approach and continue the rich tradition of ongoing professional development for our teachers and for future generations of student scientists. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Next on the list is Chris Wernemont, representing the Minnesota Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Mr. Wernemont, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Chris Wernemont, and I'm the 612 Math District Program Facilitator for Minneapolis Public Schools, as well as a member of the Minnesota Council of Teachers of Mathematics. I'm speaking in support of House File 3344 to provide a grant to the Minnesota Council of Teachers of Mathematics. This bill will allow math teachers to receive pedagogical and content professional development to implement the revised Minnesota 2022 math standards. This statewide support for math teacher development is important as it has been 15 years since the math standards were last updated and supporting teachers through a change in math standards was important in 2007 and is important today. Opportunities for teachers to learn deeply about the revised standards will have a direct impact on their students achievement of the new standards. Through the Minnesota Council of Teachers of Mathematics, we have a great opportunity to use the statewide organization that has representation from all regions of Minnesota to help math teachers across the state learn about the revised standards. While the standards are still in draft form, the first draft includes more emphasis on data science, computational thinking, and computer science. Additionally, there are specific references to understanding relevant problems as well as real world examples found in historical and contemporary Dakota and Anishinaabe communities and in other communities. Providing support for math teachers as they shift their teaching to include these topics will play a key role in the successful implementation of these revised standards. House File 3344 provides the necessary professional development support of math and science teachers across the state of Minnesota as they change their instruction to implement the revised math and science standards in their classrooms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wernemont. 
Representative Erickson, I see you have a question and uh, I don't need to tell you we're running up against uh, the clock here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment that I thought the regional centers of excellence had a responsibility to, to stop development when we switch to new standards. So that's just a comment. And uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Representative Wolgamot, if we typically uh, do give funding to the councils to help with the staff development, but uh, I'll await answers from, uh, from the department. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Uh, is there anyone from the department uh, present today who would like to respond? Mr. Rooney, I see you're here. If you would uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, my name is Ado Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of uh, Education. Just to, just to clarify, Representative Erickson, was your question around whether the state provides funding for uh, councils to provide professional development? Representative Erickson? Uh, yes. Mr. Rooney? I don't have a catalog right now on me in terms of the number or the any grants that have gone out to specific councils. I know we've done work in the past with councils, uh, whether it be formal through um, funded or work that we do in collaborative relationships with them around professional development as they have many of the experts in the state in different in different areas. Um, so, but I'm happy to go back to the, um, come back to the committee with a list of any grants that we've had in the past that the state has provided. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. With that, Representative Wogama, oh, excuse me, let me assure the committee that when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of the bill hearing. We received no request from the public to testify. With that, Representative Wogama, any closing comments? Mr. Chair members, thank you for your time this morning and I urge your support for this legislation so that we can ensure that our teachers have the resources they need to teach to the standards that they require to teach to for the betterment of all of our students. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Thank you, Representative Wolgamot. And with that, Representative Wolgamot renews his motion to lay over House File 3344 as amended for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date. Members, with that, uh, thank you all. Thank you to uh, the bill authors and testifiers today. We will see you tomorrow. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm.